Welcome to an unexpected uh, QAV event this week, uh, recording this on Tuesday, the 25th of April, 2023. I'm in Brisbane, TK's in Toronto, where I wasn't expecting to hear from him for a couple of weeks, but he surprised me with his presence like Jesus just popped in all of a sudden, like, oh, I'm here. How are you, TK? <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Yeah. No, I thought we had planned last week to do one this week at the same time. Go. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, anyway, it'll, it's I'm clear and free, so let's go. That's good. So uh, how's the last uh, bit of the travel been going? Yeah, good. We had uh, a couple of nights and days in New Orleans before this. Now I'm in Toronto with Jenny and Alex who've arrived, which is good. Haven't seen them for nearly a month, so that's great. Um, and Roddy and I had uh, time before New Orleans in a place called Amelia Island, just outside of Jacksonville in Florida, which was good. Yeah. Wow. And tell which me about the, the highlight. Red, Redneck Riviera. I saw your photo of the of, on the beach, Redneck Riviera. Tell me about the highlights of New Orleans. Did you do anything uh, fun there? I think it's probably better to talk about the lowlights. I mean, I, I absolutely hated the French Quarter there. It was just full of people, um, really touristy, hard to get around. And then you sort of went one street away and it was like boarded up places and you didn't feel safe. So I highly recommend people don't go to New Orleans for the French Quarter, which is the tourist attraction, Bourbon Street and all that. But um, we jumped on the bus and saw the rest of New Orleans and then went to other parts outside of the French Quarter and it was a lovely town, beautiful town. Well, it's been, I think, as I said last week, it's been probably 20 years since I've been in New Orleans, but I used to love the French Quarter. I mean, yeah, it's very touristy, it's true, but I love the, you know, once you got off Bourbon Street and you went out to, you know, some of the other like blocks we hit a few blues clubs and jazz clubs but i do remember being there once putting my headphones on just sort of walking listening to i don't know music or something as before before the year of podcasts and then all of a sudden just thinking ah oh, i haven't been paying attention to where i was and it was i was the only white guy and people were giving me this look like i think one guy said to me you must be lost boy or something like mm. that. I was like, yeah, I am mm. sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, we didn't feel safe in some places of it, so we got out of there quick. But um, uh, outside of the French Quarter, it was fine. It was right. really nice, clean, cruisy sort of place with good restaurants and bars and things. So, yeah. Did good. you see any blues, any jazz? What? No. No, well, there's nothing, well, literally nothing in the French Quarter. Really? Um, wow. Yeah. And then there was one There was one street that the tourist bus guide said, this is where the music is, but it just looked really touristy as well. It's um, changed a lot. And, you know, I as know I said was, last I time. We were, I don't know if we were there during spring break or what, but it was full of frat boys and hen's nights and yes. thousands of of people just milling about, doing nothing, getting in the way. It was just awful. Not your speed? No. No? No women flashing their breasts when people threw them uh, chains of beads from balconies? Oh, is that what that's about? No, well, there wasn't. There's people throwing beads from balconies, but it just seemed to be, you know, getting the young boys to fight each other to get them. No, you're supposed to flash your boobs if somebody throws you a chain of beads. Ah, okay. No, that wasn't going on. <laughs> I flashed mine a couple of times when I was there. Didn't really get the reaction that I'd hoped for. <laughs> anyway, all right. Well, that's disappointing. Um, have you been paying attention to investing? I have today. <laughs> I've had a bit of time <laughs> to go over things today. Well, I uh, I haven't because uh, I wasn't planning on doing a show with you this week so i've got really nothing to talk about we've got a couple of questions that we'll get into i guess i can yep. do a portfolio update the market was tracking along quite nicely for a few days then again last week and then they must have worked out that you were coming back soon and 
everything sort of uh, yeah. took a turn for the worst uh, at one point there, but let's see where we are. Oh, two, is, that, oh, is that because uh, Tucker Carlson left Fox News or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> I saw that in the New York Times this morning. Uh, yeah. I, I did. I did have to wonder how he had any credibility left with the audience after all of the revelations came out from the Dominion case that he was secretly that didn't was believe invest, anything that, was that he said. That was a investment for the private equity people who paid $28 million for Dominion four years ago and then made $780 million US in four years. Well, they yeah, they haven't sold it, but yeah. I'm not sure how, where that money goes that they got from the settlement, but I yeah, I'm sure some of it will get back to them and maybe a special dividend or something. <laughs> Wasn't it to make up for lost revenue for the business for the last few years? Oh, it's meant to be, yeah, but um, it's an outsized payment. And then the second one's coming, which is they're talking about not settling. So Smartmatic or whatever it is. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Well, portfolio report since inception, uh, we're up 18.61% uh, CAGA per annum, according to Nevexa versus the STW up 7.42% per annum over that time. So that's pretty good. Um, what are we, nearly a month into this quarter? This quarter, we're up 4.57% per annum versus the STW up 2.02%. So, um, you know, we're having a good quarter vis-a-vis -vis the benchmark. Um, this financial year, we're up 15.7% per annum versus the STW up 16.81%. So we've nearly caught up to the benchmark for the financial year. and We've still got a few months left to go and we're outperforming it so far this quarter, which is fascinating because... You know, going back, uh, like going back to November last year, we were at three point two percent versus the STW at thirteen point four. We were underperforming quite dramatically, and we have nearly, uh, nearly caught up. So that's interesting. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's just that's just swings and roundabouts, really, isn't it? In the short term, mm. um, the market, I think, had one of the best Januarys ever, and now it's it's come off again since then. I mean, we're probably not going to get double market this financial year, but you know, uh, um, if even if we just match the benchmark, I'll be happy because mm. not many, not many fund managers, not many investors, investors are able to even meet the benchmark. Considering well, not just that, it's been a very turbulent year. It's been a yeah. very turbulent year. So um, to get twelve percent or whatever that was you said before, we're getting is is pretty good. 15.7 for this 15.7 there you go yeah. yeah wow and again as we found the last uh, couple of years the breakdown of that according to Nevexa capital gain is only 7.17% income return is 8.54% so wow. more than half of that is coming from dividends and um well, we don't have SK. Um, did we have SKT this year? It might have been the Sky. No, that's in the light portfolios. It's not even hasn't even been in the dummy. They they had this massive capital return that right. I know yep. spiked um, one of our uh, uh, light portfolios, but that's not part of this. Let's look at the big ones for the dummy portfolio this financial year lau up 224% so far <laughs> yeah it's good um rsg up 35 smr my accidental buy up 46 <laughs> trs up 33 woodside up uh, 24 CLX up 36, CVL up 32, DUR up 41, IGL up 55. Yeah, so a lot of them have done well, well but L LAU, what a what a corker that's been. There must be some big dividend pays in there, though, to have an 8% dividend yield. Yeah, so... Um, the Maybe the coal stocks, I would have thought. 
Well, Lindsay, uh, LAU, uh, 9% mm. uh, income return on that. Um, but the share price has, you know, been very good as well. But yeah, we've we've yeah. done quite well out of a couple of dividends from them. One in October and uh, one in April that were both quite good. But yeah, I, I I don't know the breakdown for the rest of it. Uh, I don't know how to. Well, yeah, let's see. Um, good dividends this financial year from AMO, ASG, BFG, BRI, CVL, FEX. Big one from FEX. Um, uh, IGL, KOV, KSC, LAU, M Meyer. Um, Meyer's actually hasn't done very well for from a capital gain perspective. It's down twelve percent, but um, uh, a nice dividend sort of neutralized right. a lot of that. Um, and it, they, yeah, they still haven't paid out. I think that doesn't pay out until like the 11th of May or something, the Maya dividend. It was crazy. Like the X, the X date was in mid-March and the payment date's in May. It's one of those terrible ones, you know. <laughs> they just tell yeah. you, it, like in the in my alert spreadsheet, it's just, you know, it, it's technically a rule one sell except for we're holding on to it because of the, the dividend, you know. Or classic retailer to pay the invoice on the last day. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, they're on 90 day terms with paying their dividends. Mm. Anyway, yeah. so that's that portfolio uh, doing good all in all. It's been sort of a touchy year, but right now it's looking pretty strong. Yeah, good. Well, do you have anything else you want to talk about in terms of. Uh, news of the investing world this week tk or do we just get into some questions i guess just get into some questions i, I don't really have any news of the investing world all the news over here does like i was i happened to turn on bloomberg this morning because the the um, i was looking through some channels and the uh the headline was morning opening in australia so i thought oh okay i'll turn it on and it was it was nice to see the opera house on the harbour bridge in the background of the tv presenter who then talked about the US market, nothing about Australia at all. So, so that was disappointing. And um, of course, it's yeah, Anzac Day about... here today and the market's closed anyway. Right, because I did try and download the Fin Review before we got, went on there and there was none. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, thanks for working on a public holiday, Cam. <laughs> it's no <laughs> public holidays when you uh, run your own business, as I'm sure everyone who runs their own business knows. Yeah. Chris, he said to me, oh, you're not taking the day off. And I'm like, who's putting out the podcast if I take the day off? <laughs> Chat GPT's not doing it for me yet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you're, you're holding down the fort there. Alex is over here with me. So um, yeah. you're doing it this week. Yeah. So speaking of which, I had to do the buy Thank list you. yesterday. And, um, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't done a buy list um, for quite a while because I you know, use Alex's uh, every week and she uses your sheet. I, if I do do one, I use the Flipman model. And so, you know, I have, I have, um, I had to grab data out of Alex's sheet. Um, I had to grab data out of the work that Maxi does for us. I have a, um, uh, a freelancer who does some analysis work for us each week and she's out of new york i have uh chris stratton who's built his automated model that also cross-references um the manual data that he pulls out of stock doctor and we cross-reference that against alex's call on the manual data each week um so i had four data sets that and then I did my and then I had the stock doctor data set that I had to pull into the Flipman model, and I needed to pull all of that data together and cross reference it against each other and you know and and figure out one version of the truth for this. Normally, yeah. it would have taken me all day and broken my brain to do that. I just opened up GPT and I said, "Listen, I've got this problem. I need to integrate these data sets 
with these columns and this data. I need to compare this column to that, this column in this sheet to that column in that sheet. And, uh, and, and if it agrees, I need this result. If it disagrees, I need that result, blah, 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 blah. I spent half an hour writing my, all of my problems into English language, gave it to GPT. And it was like, sure, here's how you do it. Boom, 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 boom. Here's a formula for this. Here's a formula for that. Here's a formula for this. I implemented it and it bloody worked. And I tell you, it was insane how uh, how many problems it solved for me. I couldn't have got through yesterday um, without GPT. It just, it absolutely saved my bacon yesterday without Alex. Um, so I tell you people, if you, <laughs> if you still think GPT is just a fancy chat bot, um, and you do anything that involves information work, um, you're really, you're missing out. It, it absolutely blew my mind again yesterday what it enabled me to do. Yeah, well, as Ruddy calls it, chat GDP. <laughs> GDP? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, so there you go. Uh, thank you, GPT-4, for saving my bacon yet again yesterday. All right, well, let's get into the questions. Um, first one is from John. Hi, John. In reference to share investing versus share trading on the ATO website, for tax purposes, which one does Tony use? And then he hope, uh, helpfully included a link to the ATO's website. Uh, and, and I know we've talked about this before over the years. And I, I replied to John, look, I'm pretty sure you classify yourself as a share investor as opposed to a share trader. And we talk about CGT implications of buying and selling all the time. Mm -hmm. But do you just want to talk about that uh, a little bit for John's benefit, how you think of the, yeah. the difference and how the ATO thinks of the difference? Yeah, sure. And I guess the disclaimer is this is not individual tax advice for John or for anyone else listening. So look it up yourself on the ATO website, or, but more importantly, talk to your tax accountant about it. Uh, so my understanding is that um, you can you can basically nominate which one you are yourself. As, and as long as you've done a reasonable number of trades during the year, you can nominate yourself as a share trader or you can nominate yourself as a share investor. And the ATO pretty much, from what I've been told, accepts that nomination. The difference being if you're a share investor, you get the capital gains tax relief, which means if I hold a share for 12 months or more, uh, then the capital gains tax is halved, um, which I think is fairly important. Um, the other option is to be a share trader, which just treats it uh, as normal sort of um, operating expenses and income, just like you do on your own PAYE tax form. So. If you're investing in your own name and you make a, make a capital gain, you'll pay whatever your top marginal rate is of tax on that and you'll get no CGT relief. Um, the dividends will be taxed at your top marginal rate as well. But if you're an investor, you do get the CGT relief after 12 months. That's that's probably the main difference. And, and certainly share trading would help some people if they're on a low marginal tax rate. Um, and it gets to be sort of line ball if you're in, say, uh, uh, if you're operating through a company where the, the company tax rate is at, at the most 30% and half of the top marginal rates, 27 and a half percent. So it's, you know, pretty close either way, really. So what are the advantages of being, of calling yourself a trader versus an investor then? Yeah, it, it, you can. Um, probably, there's not a whole a whole lot. You just treat it as an operating business. So you're conducting a business where your stock is shares, and you're selling them and taking the income straight away to the P and L. Whereas as an investor, it's more like a balance sheet item, which is it's seen as an asset, and therefore you get capital gains tax relief. So it just depends on what what um, investment structure you're using what the tax rate is in that structure and whether you want to get the deductions um, uh, available for offset maybe against other income. Well, I guess it, that's the same both ways, but 
um, I've never seen an advantage in doing in being a share trader versus being an investor because you lose that CGT relief. It sounds like you're saying that if you're a trader, you classify it as your source of income, whereas if you're an investor, it's a long-term wealth building exercise. Is that right? Yeah, so one's one seen as being a movement of assets and one's seen as being operating income like you're operating a coffee shop. Yeah, Instead right. of selling coffee, you're selling shares. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks for explaining that. Hope that helps, John. Uh, the only other question I have is from Daryl. Uh, he's asking for the latest view on using Renko charts. He says, in noticing the press lately about WHC returns and now their decision to go early, on their mind expansion. I had a look at the charts and looking back in this case, at least following the Renko chart to sell would have given a much better outcome than the coal price sell. So he said Renko would have got him out at $8.50 to $9, whereas the coal price commodity sell would have kicked in around $7. Um, and I said, the last I heard you were still thinking about Renko charts and testing it. Is that still where it's at? Yeah, so Ruddy did some analysis for me and <laughs> Ruddy being Ruddy gave it to me the day before we left for the for the States. So I had a chance to go through it today um, when I saw the question. Uh, or actually, I saw the question on Facebook a couple of days ago whenever it was, was put on there. So I had pulled out Ruddy's analysis. Um, and I think, I think the Renko charts are useful in situations like Whitehaven Coal, where we've had a big a big increase in the share price and it's a long way away from its sell price. We've talked about this before. When do you sort of sell out? Do you wait till the sell price and give all your capital gains back or do you sell out earlier? And Renko has you selling out earlier. And as, as Brett says, it's kind of like a moving stop loss. Um, there's a mathematical formula behind it, uh, which we could actually calculate and put into an alert, but... It's probably just easier to look up the chart and work out when to sell. Um, so Ruddy's analysis actually showed that rank, using Renko charts gave about a 10% better return than not using them. Um, now, that, that's the first sort of a piece of analysis that you know, he's done and I've looked at. And it was done way back. It was using the first time I did a transaction dump from the dummy portfolio which I think was about a year or a year and a half in. So there's about a year and a half worth of data in it. And then, so we know what the results are from not using Renko charts. And then Mark went back and did two things. He he didn't buy a share that the dummy portfolio did if the Renko chart was red. So it was a sell. Um, and he sold a share when the Renko chart went from green to red. Um, which we may not have done in the dummy portfolio, certainly probably wouldn't have done at the same time as the Renko chart turned to a sell. We used the three-point trend lines. And so it, it, sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't, but overall it was a 10% better off result from using the Renko chart. So I think it's worth pursuing. I, my next plan would be to, for myself to set up a dummy portfolio and trade it using Renko charts, as well as all the other things we use. We don't change any of those and give it maybe six months at least to see whether, you know, it turns out in real life to, to be better off than um, than uh, just the paper analysis we've done. And I think if we have two ticks for that, then I think we can implement it into the into the process. Mm. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay. Yeah. So it was, is the main, I think the main thing certainly will help in cases like uh, the, the WHC case where something's gone up a lot and we it's a long way above its sell line. But it seemed to me just from what I saw today that it was also helping in not buying something that was still red on the Renko chart, even though it may have been passing all our other tests. Um, it, 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 you know, in a lot of cases, they were still falling knives. Mm. Mm. So you're going to implement that... Um sort of Renko dummy portfolio and you'll report. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just pick the next you know, top 10 stocks in the buy list and put them into a dummy portfolio and frame them for a, six months or so and see how they go. Oh, fascinating. All right. Well, good yeah. good timing of that question, Daryl. And thanks to you and Ruddy for doing that analysis for us. That's interesting.
Yeah, and, I, and the other piece of analysis I also had time to go through today was uh, Ryan's work on buying from the top of the buy list versus buying from the bottom of the buy list and similar sort of results. So he he did it differently. He uh, went back through the history of all the buy lists that we've produced and um, at least in their current form, that's about two and a half years worth of buy lists and uh, recon like picked... Um, Oh, I think it was about 10 or 12 at random and then uh, used the, the top 10 stocks on the buy list at that time and traded them forward. And it was a bit of work because he had to check the commodity charts and check the three-point sales for those stocks. And then if they were a sell, to, to buy another one from a buy list at that sell time. So he's done a fair bit of manual work on it. But again, his results um, are interesting. They're showing that buying from the top of the buy list is better than buying from the bottom. Uh, and there was some, there was I think about two cases where it wasn't, and that was they were pretty recent ones. Um, but in the main, it was buying from the top was better from buying than buying from the bottom. So um, I had Dylan had done some work before Ryan to suggest that the QAV cutoff should be 0.2 rather than 0.1, and I think. From what I've seen in Ryan's um, early results, that's probably going to be the case. Uh, so again, I'll set up a dummy portfolio for that and and run it forward for six months and just see um, the difference in buying from the top versus buying from the bottom and uh, validate that going forward. And then if that's that works, then uh, put that into practice as well. And that that will come with limitations because we may not be able to find fifteen to twenty stocks with a QAV score above 0.2. So um, that's why I want to test it on paper first and get the, the kinks out from doing it live or doing it um, on a live on a desktop anyway, going forward. Did that factor in eight ADT cutoffs? Uh, he did do a bit of analysis for me with, um, he did he did buying the top 10 stocks on the buy list, buying the bottom 10 stocks on the buy list. And we chose 10 because, um, when he bought 20, there was a big overlap because there wasn't enough stocks to, to separate them. So he did 10. And uh, then he also did the top 10 with an ADT above, I think it was a, a hundred thousand, either a hundred thousand or 500,000. Um, so larger ADT stocks from the top and they also perform better as well. Mm. Right. That's interesting. Yeah, so higher higher ADT stocks perform better than lower ADT stocks. Well, I think it was just because they were coming from the top of the buy list was the more important thing. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, good stuff. That's that's uh, mm. interesting. I love it when there's um, new ideas. Yeah. Speaking of new ideas, uh, somebody asked me again yesterday when they can get their hands on the latest version of the Bredelator. Um, that we've been testing for quite a while now, um, the one with the uh, second byline mm -hmm. built into it. Um, I know that the last email conversation we had about this was, uh, I think, before you went away. You said you were still testing it. That's still the status on that? Oh, no, it's fine to go out. It's it's okay. Cool. Yeah, it looks okay. good to me. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. I yeah. will. Um, I'll work with Brett. Um, I'll shoot him an email after this, and we'll get a public version of that ready. So, cool. Thanks for that, and thank you to Brett Fisher for his uh, constant work on the Bredelator. One other thing I forgot to mention at the upside uh, at the beginning of the show was one of the things I decided doing the buy list yesterday is that steel was a sell. Have you looked at the steel chart? I haven't. No, I haven't looked at the charts for a while. It um, steel sort of plummeted this month, and I decided it was a sell, which had a material impact because um, we owned a lot of blue scope in the mm -hmm. dummy portfolio and the light portfolio, and in my super. So I had to sell a ton of blue scope yesterday, and mm -hmm. sold it all at a profit too, which was nice, but. Again, it was one of those indicators where I didn't look at the Renko though, but it was one of these indicators where the commodity sell got us out while the share price still looked, you know, relatively healthy. Right. It hasn't started to turn down, I don't think, dramatically. I haven't looked today. Well, 
I didn't look at what happened to it yesterday after I dumped it, but um, yeah, it came actually. It, it fell a lot yesterday. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people decided it was a sell. <laughs> it, it opened at twenty one thirty nine and hit a low of twenty fifty three yesterday. Stabilized around twenty dollars seventy, but if you know, it's been going up for the last uh, you know uh, six months. Yeah, 